we wish to acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen speaking peoples on whose traditional territory we stand, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and West Saanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land where we live, work, and play continue to this day. A wise individual who was renowned for being a good neighbor once passed on advice that in times of fear and uncertainty, we should look for the helpers. You will find people who are helping. This has certainly been true in our recent experiences. We have all relied on the selflessness of many, many helpers. This performance is dedicated to those people, the amazing individuals who have given of themselves in the service of others. We see in them dedication to community, consideration and care of others, attention to truth, courage to do what is right and necessary, and respect for every individual. Within them, we see the heart of a griffin. As you listen to the simple stories we have gathered and you enjoy these beautiful songs, we hope helpers in your life come to mind and that you are inspired to share your gratitude with them. Once upon a time, a wise old man decided to go on a journey. So he packed a small bag, said goodbye to his wife, and set off. He traveled all day without meeting anyone. When it was evening, he came to a small village. I think I'll stop here for the night, he said to himself. Near the center of the village, he met a group of people. So he introduced himself. I'm a simple traveler, he said 
looking for a safe place to sleep and a hot meal. We'd be glad to offer you a place to sleep, the villagers told him, but we have very little food. Our crops were very poor this year, and there's not much to eat in the whole village. Most of us are just barely getting by. I'm sorry to hear that, the old man said, but you needn't worry about feeding me. I already have everything I need. In fact, I was thinking of making some stone soup to share with all of you. Stone soup, the villagers asked. What's that? We've never heard of stone soup. Oh, it's wonderful, said the old man. Best soup I've ever tasted. If you bring me a soup pot and some water, I'll make some for all of us. And so the villagers rushed back to their homes. When they returned, one was carrying a large soup pot. Another had wood for a fire and others brought water. When the fire was going and the water had begun to boil, the old man took out a small silk pouch. With great ceremony, he reached in and pulled out a smooth, round stone. He carefully dropped the stone into the boiling water. The villagers watched eagerly. The old man began to slowly stir the pot, sniffing the aroma and licking his lips in anticipation. I do like a tasty stone soup, he said. Of course, stone soup with cabbage. Now that's really special. I might be able to find a bit of cabbage, one villager said, and off she went to her house, returning with a small cabbage she had stored away in her pantry. Wonderful, said the old man, as he added the cabbage to the pot. This reminds me of the time I had stone soup with cabbage and a bit of salted beef. It was unbelievably good. After a moment of silence, the village butcher spoke up. I know where there's a bit of salted beef, he said, and off he went to his shop to get it. When he returned, the old man added the beef to the soup pot and continued to stir. Can you imagine what this soup would taste like if we had a bit of onion and perhaps a few potatoes and a carrot or two and some mushrooms? Oh, this would be a meal fit for royalty. And before he knew it, the soup pot was filled to the brim with vegetables of all kinds, carrots and potatoes, mushrooms and onions, turnips and green beans, beets and celery, all brought by the men and women and children of the village. Not only that, but the village baker came out with some fresh bread and butter. And as the soup simmered slowly over the fire, the wonderful aroma began to waft over the villagers, and they began to relax and talk together, sharing songs and stories and jokes. When the soup was finally done, the old man ladled it out into bowls, and they all shared a delicious meal together. There was more than enough for everyone to eat their fill. Afterward, they all declared it was the best soup they had ever tasted. The mayor of the village pulled the old man aside and quietly offered him a great deal of money for the magic stone, but the old man refused to sell it. The next morning, he woke early and packed up his belongings. As he was leaving the village, he passed by a group of children playing at the side of the road. He handed the youngest one the silk pouch containing the stone, and he whispered, It is not the stone that performed the magic. It was all of us together.
Long ago, the kangaroo was grooming her joey on the bank of a brook. They liked to listen to the water burble as the mama combed her baby's fur. On this day, an old wombat staggered towards them. Oh dear, the kangaroo whispered to her baby. This wombat is old and sick. He must have great, great grandchildren already. The mother kangaroo thought she heard the sound of weeping. As the wombat veered closer, she heard him say, useless and worthless, worthless and useless. What's the trouble, friend wombat, she asked. Huh? He said, startled. Who said that? I did, said the kangaroo. A kangaroo and her joey. I'm blind, the wombat replied. Nobody wants me around. Nobody thinks about me. I'm no good anymore. They've abandoned me, all of them. The kangaroo, who had a tender heart, said, It's not as bad as all that. I'll be your friend. My joey and I will show you where the tastiest grass grows. She let the wombat hold her tail. Then, slowly, she led him over to the juiciest grass and cleanest water. The old wombat sighed with pleasure. It made the kangaroo happy to see him feeling better. Suddenly, she remembered her joey. She had told him to stay close, but he wandered off again. She raced back to look for him. So many times this had happened. She'd look for food, and when she looked up, he had wandered off. It scared her terribly. She found her joey asleep under a gum tree. Not wanting to wake him from his nap, she decided to go back and check on the old wombat. Something was moving in the bush. An aboriginal hunter silently stalking the wombat. Already, his boomerang was raised above his head, its smooth edges ready to slice the air. The kangaroo froze. She couldn't even breathe. She wanted to run, but the wombat was like her joey. She had to protect him. The kangaroo began to stomp on the branches and twigs under her feet. Thump, thump, crack, crack, she pounded the earth. The hunter turned toward her. Run, she screamed to the wombat. Run, there's a hunter. The wombat took off crazily, not knowing where he was going, and the hunter didn't care. Now all he wanted was the kangaroo. She hopped as hard and fast as she could into the bush, away, away from where she had left her joey asleep. Her heart thumped wildly in her throat, and she ran for her life. At last she came to a cave. She was too tired to go farther, and collapsed on the dirt floor inside. At least he would have to kill her in the cool dark not out in the open where the other animals would be forced to watch. The hunter ran past the mouth of the cave. The kangaroo stayed inside, listening for his return. She was afraid to go out. Finally, she saw him walk past the mouth of the cave again, his boomerang hanging from his hand. She waited until it was safe, and then ran as fast as she could to get back to the gum tree. There was her joey, awake and ready to play. Together they went to look for the wombat, but he had gone. What the kangaroo mother didn't know was that the wombat wasn't a wombat. He was actually the great god Biami, who had put on a disguise. Biami had descended from the sky world to find out which of his creatures had the kindest heart. Now he had an answer that pleased him greatly, the kangaroo. Biami wanted to give her the gift that would help her most of all. So he called the sky spirits together and said, go down below to where the eucalyptus grow tall. Peel the long strips of bark and make a dilly bag apron. Give it to the kangaroo mother and explain that she must tie it around her waist. And so they did. At the very moment the kangaroo mother tied the apron around her waist, Biami transformed it into soft kangaroo fur. It grew into her own flesh. Now she had a pouch in which to carry her baby Joey. He could even sleep in there as she went about her daily tasks. The kangaroo mother was very happy with her gift. But because she was the kindest creature of all, she didn't want to keep it only for herself. She thought about all the other kangaroo mothers, and about the wallaby mothers, and the kangaroo rats, and all the other marsupials. Biami loved the kangaroo's generous heart, so he decided to make pouches for all the other marsupial mothers. Ever since then, their babies almost never get lost.
once there was a parrot. His feathers were beautiful with rich colors of green, red, and yellow. His eyes were shiny and black, his beak a pale yellow. Altogether, he was a most handsome bird. This parrot lived in a fig tree, and oh, how he loved that tree. He loved the way its leaves shaded him from the harsh, glaring light of the midday sun. He loved the cool shade it cast over him. He loved its endless whisperings, its creakings and rustlings. He loved the way its branches rose and fell, swaying with every breeze. He loved the feel of the cool, smooth bark beneath his toes. He loved the sweet fruit it so freely gave him. Every evening, as he settled on the branches of his tree home, he would say, how happy I am, how content, peaceful, and free. I owe my tree so very much. I'll never abandon it for another refuge. And closing his eyes, he would listen with delight to the soft music of the tree's fluttering leaves. Chakra, king of the gods, heard the parrot's words and decided to test him. He withered the tree and dried it until the leaves blackened and died. Dust now lay on the branches where sweet dews once gathered. But the parrot would not leave. He sat on the dead branches, slowly lifting his claws. He climbed from branch to branch, circling the tree to keep from the glaring sunlight, which beat upon him. In his mind's eye, he could see it, covered not with dust, but with green leaves, all swaying and rustling in the breeze. Should friends part, just because bitter fortune has struck, said the parrot to himself, Days pass and fortunes change. My words were sincere and true, and my tree, I'll not leave you. And he would not leave. Though days passed and other animals questioned his choice and encouraged him to leave, the parrot remained steadfast and content. Perched on the dead branches among the dry, rattling leaves, he watched the sun rise and he watched it set, but he did not abandon his tree home. Chakra, watching, smiled and a golden breeze blew. New buds formed, green leaves unfolded, fruits swelled, and the dust whirling blew away. Amazed, the parrot sat sheltered once again among the green leafy branches of his beloved tree. Little bird, said the king of the gods, the whole universe is brought to life by a steadfast and faithful heart. Even the lofty gods smiled when meeting one who has attained such unwavering contentment. While outwardly you may only be a little bird, inwardly you bear the gift of life. Live contented with your tree, and may all being so contented be. And laughing, the great god Chakra rose up into the bluest of blue skies, the steadfast little parrot, once again sipping the sweet dews, rubbed his beak on the smooth, cool bark. Oh, how contented he was!
A long time ago in China, there was a boy named Ping who loved flowers. Everything that he planted burst into bloom. Up came flowers, bushes, and even big fruit trees, all as if by magic. Everyone in the kingdom loved flowers too. They planted them everywhere, and the air smelled like perfume. The emperor loved birds and animals, but flowers most of all, and he tended his own garden every day. But the emperor was getting very old, and he needed to choose a successor to his throne. Who would this successor be, and how would he choose? Because the emperor loved flowers so much, he decided to let the flowers do the choosing. The next day, a proclamation was issued. All of the children in the whole land, far and wide, were to come to the palace. There they would be given special flower seeds by the emperor. Whoever shall show me the best flowers in a year's time, he said, will succeed me to the throne. When Ping received his seeds from the emperor, he was so happy, for he was sure he could grow the most beautiful flowers. Ping filled a flower pot with rich soil. He planted the seeds in it very carefully. He watered them every day. He couldn't wait to see them sprout, grow, and blossom into beautiful flowers. Day after day passed, but nothing grew in his pot. Ping was getting very worried. He put new soil into a bigger pot. Then he transferred the seeds into the rich black soil. After two months, he waited. Still, nothing happened. He watched patiently, by and by, as the whole year passed. Spring finally came, and all the children put on their best clothes to greet the emperor. They rushed to the palace with their beautiful flowers, eagerly hoping to be chosen. Ping was ashamed of his empty pot. He thought the other children would laugh at him because, for once, he couldn't get his flowers to grow. His clever friend ran by holding a great big plant. Ping, he said, you're not really going to the emperor with an empty pot, are you? Couldn't you grow great big flowers like mine? I've grown lots of flowers better than yours, Ping said. It's just these seeds that won't grow. Ping's father overheard this and said, you did your best and your best is good enough to present to the emperor. Holding the empty pot in his hands, Ping went straight away to the palace. The emperor was looking at the flowers slowly, one by one. How beautiful all the flowers were. But the emperor was frowning and did not say a word. Finally, he came to Ping. Ping hung his head in shame, expecting to be punished. The emperor asked him, why did you bring an empty pot? Ping started to cry and replied, I planted the seeds you gave me and I watered them every day, but they didn't sprout. I put them in a better pot with better soil, but still they didn't sprout. I tended them all year long, but nothing grew. So today I had to bring an empty pot without any flowers. It was the best I could do. When the emperor heard these words, a smile slowly spread over his face, and he put his arm around Ping. Then he exclaimed to one and all, I have found him. I have found the one person worthy of being emperor. Where you got your seeds from, I don't know, for the seeds I gave you all had been cooked, so it was impossible for any of them to grow. I admire Ping's great courage to appear before me with the empty truth. And now I reward him with my entire kingdom and make him emperor of all the land.
One day, a terrible fire broke out in the forest. A huge woodland was suddenly engulfed by a raging wildfire. Frightened, all the animals fled their homes and ran out of the forest. As they came to the edge of the stream, they stopped to watch the fire. They were feeling very discouraged, powerless, and frightened. They were all bemoaning the destruction of their homes. Every one of them thought there was nothing they could do about the fire, except one little hummingbird. This particular hummingbird decided it would do something. It swooped into the stream and it picked up a few drops of water and it went into the forest and put them on the fire. Then it went back to the stream and did it again, and it kept going back again and again and again. All of the other animals watched in disbelief. Some tried to discourage the hummingbird with comments like, "Don't bother. It's too much. You're too little. Your wings will burn. Your beak is too tiny." Only a drop. You can't put this fire out. And as the animal stood around disparaging the little bird's efforts, the bird noticed how hopeless and forlorn they looked. Then, one of the animals shouted out and challenged the hummingbird in a mocking voice, "What do you think you're doing?" And the brave little hummingbird, without wasting time or losing a beat, looked back and said, "I am doing what I can." When you're broken down and tired of living life on a merry-go-round, and you can't find a fighter, but I see it in you, so we gon' walk it out.
I asked, what do I need to live at my best? And the old woman answered, truth and courage. I said, not purpose and strength? And the old woman explained, truth and courage are purpose and strength. They are the roots of everything powerful, everything spiritual. When you keep your truth in front of you and have the courage to keep moving forward toward it, through anything that arises, you live at your best. I said, even if I stumble? And the old woman replied, especially then. We would like to wish everyone a safe and joyous time with family and friends during the holiday season. And may you find the heart of a griffin in everyone you meet.